Welcome. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com with your eye-opener report for BoilingFrogsPost.com. As anyone who has logged on to the internet in the last five years is all too aware, social media websites have exploded in popularity to the point where they are virtually impossible to avoid. Facebook is expected to hit 1 billion users later this year. Twitter handles almost 300 million tweets per day. Every second, one hour of video footage is uploaded to YouTube. With this rise in popularity of social media has come an attendant rise in another trend. The dinosaur media's attempts to portray these websites as revolutionary tools for freedom-loving people around the world. It's being called the Twitter Revolution, a protest of Iran's election outcome. Iranians using Twitter, YouTube, texting, cell phone videos, any social media they can to mobilize and tell the world what's happening in their country. It's a communications revolution with global implications for repressive governments trying to control the internet and social networking. And of course, I imagine that there's been a lot of reaction online, Evan, to these events in Tunisia and in the wider Arab world. What have you been reading exactly? That's right. Uh, Twitter has been very active over the past day or two. People seem somewhat amazed that they're able to see such a momentous event essentially unfolding live on their own computers. Egypt's uprising is a real movement that was born in a virtual world. Led by young, educated activists like Ahmed Salah, who understand the power of social networking. Millions of Egyptians live on Facebook. A call for action went out on Facebook, which initially reached more than a million people and was then amplified by a torrent of Twitter messages. From Moldova to Iran, Egypt to Tunisia, hyperventilating reporters around the world with deadlines to meet and little information to go on have resorted to making up stories about how Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube have shaped the course of revolutions and uprisings around the world. The only problem with this oft-repeated narrative is that it is almost completely wrong. Now, uh, you wrote a, a commentary, I think it's going to be published uh, today, actually, in Reuters, uh, to do with the, the idea that the Western media has been portraying this as a Twitter revolution and the idea this is all happening online. Uh, is that what you found? No, not really. It's, that's an invention of CNN and the cable networks. Basically, they became desperate because they were not allowed to leave their offices to cover the demonstration, so they turned increasingly to YouTube and Twitter to uh, fill in the gaps, and suddenly then they declared it to be a Twitter revolution. But actually, my experience out talking to people on the ground, very few people have access to Twitter. It's mostly in English. Uh, it's an invention of a convenient way, a catchphrase. And it also... Um, is misleading because the movement is much broader than the relatively well-to-do people who can afford uh, to send Twitter or uh, invest in a lot of computer equipment. A lot of poor people, clerics, women in chadors were out in the streets. It wasn't just the Twittering classes. Certainly journalistic laziness can be used to explain at least some of this tendency of so-called reporters to research reports while surfing the net in the comfort of their hotel room, but this is not the whole story. In fact, the entire myth of the social media revolution has been carefully constructed by U.S. State Department-linked NGOs with a vested interest in overthrowing unfriendly regimes in certain parts of the world. And it is this story, when put together, that paints these so-called social media revolutions in an altogether darker light. Social media plays a vital role in Syria's conflict, with both sides trying to shape domestic and international opinion in their favor. Chilling videos of acts of brutality have the power to go viral and be broadcast globally on television networks, but sometimes pictures aren't everything they appear to be. Just a warning, you may find some of the images in Oksana Boyko's report disturbing. Hashtag change, status update, freedom. Social media have often been credited for empowering the Arab youth in their struggle to shake off decades-old autocracies. Fans of social media often say that without Facebook, YouTube or Twitter, the Arab Spring wouldn't have been so sweeping or so contagious. But there is also a growing number of those who believe that without these websites, the Arab revolutions wouldn't have been so deadly and so destructive. These contrived and staged YouTube videos are used by the opposition to justify a Western-backed regime change project on the country. The creativity of Syrian opposition fighters has already been exposed before. 
when they were caught posing as pro-Assad troops supposedly carrying out the regime's brutalities. But what started as stage killings for social media consumption is now leading to quite real deaths. In Syria these days, some Facebook pages really look like hit lists. We got used to this. I mean, this is happening now for one year. The head of Aleppo Chamber of Industry says many of his fellow businessmen found their photos and personal details posted on the opposition's yes. websites with explicit callings to murder them. This is the car, his car. This is the number of his car. This is the number of his mobile. This is where he, can, where he lives. Go kill him. Go target him. And these are not just empty threats. Dozens of public figures and government officials were gunned down in Syria in recent months just for being perceived as sympathetic to the authority. Welcome back, everyone, to Global Government News. My website is ggnonline.com, and the links will be posted in YouTube's video description. So this is part two of this news bulletin for today, and we're going to go through some Middle East news, and then we'll get into some cyborg news towards the end. Uh, but I think the overlying theme of this video is what? Propaganda and disinformation. So. Google clears key mapping software for Syria. Google announced Wednesday that is mapping software and other products uh, would be available in Syria after getting export approval by the U.S. government. So, so they're talking about Google Earth, of course, and it says here, this is what they said, free expression is a fundamental human right and a core value of our company. Uh, but sometimes there are limits to where we can make our product and services available. And linking back to that first video about Iran, uh, that, that was very short-lived. That did not last long, the color revolution that they wanted to get going there. Uh, last year, Google made the same services available to the people in Iran, but blocked access by government computers there. So this is serious, right? The U.S. government is in the midst of an initiative to promote online freedom around the world. Uh, at the same time to limit certain types of hardware and software that can be used for filtering monitoring by repressive governments that aren't like the United States or United States right so it's just like Egypt basically uh, where the Muslim Brotherhood is uh, going to probably win so it's a win for the West just like it's gonna be a win for here in Syria and just like in Libya where now Libya is being used as a basically a rogue state that will get split up too uh, is what is a funneling weapons so smuggling weapons that's what Libya is used now for for uh, trying to send them into Egypt and Syria and actually the uh, some of the terrorists Al Qaeda and in, Li in Libya were actually going to Syria to train the opposition so so here Syria would need 11 billion quickly post Assad so they're already planning uh, <laughs> they're already planning a serious future uh, without Assad, so and it has the regime change that they want hasn't taken place yet. But it says reconstruction funds in the first six months after the collapse of President Al Assad's rule, uh, mainly to support its currency and pay public sector wages. And this is just like Libya as well, where they were paying police and all that, uh, basically, so to uh, squash any type of green movement that was going on in Libya post Gaddafi, right? and to keep their little currency going so people can go and shop and stuff. The economic reconstruction, so here we go. This is exactly what I just said. The economic reconstruction plan would help to persuade Syrians wavering to join the opposition that it was thinking of their long-term interests. So, in other words, we're going to fall. We're just going to be a pro-West uh, regime change in here, so you might as well just join us, right? You can't beat them, join us. So the two uh, countries that have lined up already are Germany and UAE. So to establish a joint reconstruction initiative for Syria, then owner of Pentagon's propaganda firm admits to attack on journalists. The former president said he acted alone and independent of the contractor. So the co-owner of a major Pentagon propaganda contractor publicly admitted Thursday that he was behind a series of coordinated misinformation campaigns targeting two USA Today journalists who has scrutinized the contractor in the reporting says here that uh, he was contracting with the Pentagon uh, to employ the modern equivalent of psychological warfare. It exposed the nature and exorbitant cost of the Pentagon's information operations where war pro propaganda used abroad in places where the U.S. intervenes. And just a little side note, CNN hits a 20-year primetime ratings low. So people really are tuning out to this BS. Which is what makes a lapdog press, as I think Helen Thomas uh, 
said. You know, she was actually kicked out of, she was a White House correspondent, kicked out because she was critical of Israel. So eventually you get so desperate, you just, whatever, you know, oh yeah, Twitter revolution, okay, yeah. Pundit frenzy as Putin prepares for a European road trip. I found this article after I found another article, which was this. Putin's support sliding crisis ahead says, ooh, the think tank, huh, those damn think tanks, huh? Then we have U.S. hacks Yemeni websites in propaganda campaign. It says Secretary of State Hillary Clinton essentially admitted to playing precisely the same dirty games Al-Qaeda is playing when it carried out counter-propaganda campaigns on the websites being used by Al-Qaeda's affiliate in Yemen, challenging the anti-American narratives with others about civilians killed in terrorist strikes. She says that uh, the Al-Qaeda groups use recruitment propaganda on websites visited by tribal members of Yemen in Yemen, but she says our team plastered the same sites with altered versions that show the toll of Al-Qaeda attacks have taken on the Yemeni people. She goes, the propaganda campaign said in a speech to Special Operations Command in Tampa was conducted by the Center for Strategic Counterterrorism Communications based in the State Department. Remember that, counterterrorism and special operations. And speaking of these attacks, 12 killed in bomb attack targeting Yemen's uh, Houthis. So 12 people, including children, have been killed in a car bomb attack. So uh, moving on here, we have another one. Yemen, 35 Al-Qaeda militants killed. Yemeni's military has launched an attack on an Al-Qaeda hideout in the country's south as part of a wider offensive. So remember what I said, though. I, I don't think these guys are actually Al-Qaeda. So they're basically tribes in the southern part of Yemen. They don't want to be part of the north-south uh, union there. So then we have Judicial Watch obtains DOD and CIA records detailing meetings with bin Laden raid filmmakers. So it says here the officials disclosed to filmmakers identities of SEAL Team 6 operator and commander as film director to withhold operator's name because he shouldn't be talking out of school. So this of course was what? This was propaganda to promote the raid on bin Laden which most of the people say he didn't even live there and there's many reports, that, or there's at least many speculation that the guy was already dead for years. So, but they're just turning in this whole thing into, oh, secrecy, security, oh, leaked. And I don't know if you've seen that movie, um, Edge of Darkness with Mel Gibson, but towards the end, where the uh, British guy, the captain or lieutenant, whatever, he says, he's asked, you know, it's like, you just gotta uh, basically make the story so convoluted that nobody really knows what the truth is, right? So instead of people like, you know, being wondering, well, why, you know, why was this guy sentenced to, sentenced to 33 years in Pakistan for aiding the CIA to, quote, catch bin Laden, which he probably didn't do, instead of asking what? Why were they vaccinating these people that most of them probably are never going to get vaccinated, don't want to be, and they were taking what? Their DNA. That's the real story there. But you see how they just, they convoluted it into, oh, this is going to strain relations. Well, they're already strained. They're pissed. Why? U.S. drone strike in Pakistan kills 10 suspected militants. So another drone strike. In fact, it's the second one in 24 hours. Of course, they speak on conditions of anonymity, right? And they identify the five militants as Central Asian linked to Al-Qaeda, right? For counterterrorism. Well, who actually decides who the U.S. drones will kill? Well, it's the White House counterterrorism chief, John Brennan. The new authority over the strikes once backed enhanced interrogation techniques. Sounds so sexy, doesn't it? Enhanced interrogation techniques. And it's funny because like the, with the whole NATO Chicago summit, they were boasting about, oh, this is the same type of setup as well, that Obama had at the White House, the war room, you know, to take out bin Laden, right? You know, it sounds a lot like Hitler's bunker or something, right? A repressive regime. But we're not a repressive regime. We're spreading democracy. January 4th, 2012, Obama launches Bureau of Counterterrorism. NORAD and NORTHCOM launch Joint Cyber Division. This is, of course, after the Cyber Security Enhancement Act of 2011. Further uh, binding, what, United States and Canada. So then we have this, the globalization of U.S. Special Operation Forces. So just like the CIA, NSA, MI6, all the intelligence agencies being merged together into one, they want to establish a worldwide network linking special operation forces of allies and partner nations to combat terrorism. But for those special operation forces, just remember, you're going to be replaced by what? Robots. You'll turn into a cyborg and be replaced by robots. And you will be declared obsolete.